Hi, I'm Becky Walsh and this is Western Superwomen. Now, I first moved to Western when I went to Western College and I was a mere 19 years old. And this town was very different back then. It was kind of like a faded seaside town. And I knew that it wasn't gonna give me the kinds of opportunities that I wanted for my life. Well, since then, I've lived all over the world and I've done some amazing things. But that feeling of wanting to be at home brought me back to Western Supermare. And wow, this town has changed so much, but yet it still has this outdated reputation. So we decided that we would introduce you to some of the incredible people that live here that are making this town a really vibrant place to live. Could a life-changing disability become the opportunity for creativity? This is Linda. People make assumptions and, you know, if you are disabled, people think you've not got an intelligent mind. People think that you are stupid. This is Michael, Michael Kane. He was introduced to me two years, no, three years ago now. And at first I didn't want to show my vulnerability to anybody because it was like a hidden thing. You know, I covered my diabetes up, I covered up my poor feet, I covered up uh, the fact that, you know, things weren't always as good as they could be. At that moment, I realized that I didn't have to see with my eyes. I could see with my feelings. I was able to paint waterfalls from the sound. I was able to paint trees from the whoosh. Um, and my breakthrough was I did four pictures called Day on a Train, which was all whooshy trees, one after the other in the different hues and tones of the day. So first at dawn, then, at, then uh, during the day, then dusk, then sunset. At that moment when I'd realized I didn't actually have to look and carefully draw things, but I could take in the form and the impression of something, um, yeah, life got good. I arrived in Weston depressed. However, um, that left me without um, Your identity. A purpose, mm. right? I started to be able to gain internal skills, um, which is I didn't need to be validated by anybody else. What I needed was that quiet place inside that made me feel solid and good. Mm. And I get that now through my art. I can do that. I, I, I go and make memories. I don't I don't go to say, oh yes, I'm going to draw that tree. It's got this trunk and that shape. I can't do that. Mm. But what I do is I, I look at them, so I look at them, I look at them, I look at them, I smell, I feel, I put my hand in things, I see how warm it is, I see how cold it is. And then I've made a memory. Mm. And then when I'm making my art, I don't use brushes, because as soon as I put a brush in my hand, I'm like this, because that means I'm a painter, and I'm not a painter. I make marks, and those marks turn into pictures. Mm. Sadly, I had a very big bleed um, early September. Uh, so much so that uh, the eye got completely full of the blood, and it, the, 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 the the eye was compromised. Uh, I couldn't see out and they couldn't see in to fix it. I was talking to the surgeon and he wanted to know how it affected my living. And when I said I was an artist, he said, well, we could do something. When they took the eye patch off, I actually saw blue. Uh, the first time I'd seen a colour out of that eye for, for a long time, because that eye had been basically giving me um, beige, brown and grey, really. It, 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 it brought back a hope that it might not all be black. I've got a new lease of life. I've got a show down at the Blake Hay at the moment. I have shown in North Somerset Arts Week and I've got people have written in my book and said, I like what you do. Um, 
So I've got a little bit of confidence inside that says, it doesn't matter what I make, it doesn't matter how it looks, it, if it's nice and good for me, then it's good, to do, it's good to make. But other people may appreciate it too. Next, a woman who employed a large number of people in Western Supermare on one single opportunity. This is Jill. Why Western Supermare? Why have you made this your home? Western, there's so much going on in Western. Mm. There's so much going on in Western and it's, and each area has got different things to offer. Mm. You know, Whirlbury's got one thing, you know, that is a, diff as a different area yeah. um, to Whirl, North Whirl, yeah. and down in the town centre. Yeah. Um, uphill stunning. Ah, yeah. uphill, beautiful. Always something going on. I think Western Supermare has changed its image in the last, I don't know, would it be fair to say in the last five years? Yes. Yes. about Gilda and the story of yes. Gilda, because that's, the, yes. that's the, an, an incredible achievement that you made for Western Supermare was Gilda. So tell us about how that came about. I used to look after a guy stand who was selling rattan cane furniture, what you will. So I phoned Terry Martin, who was the rep for Darrow, and said, any chance you can get me a thousand pounds worth of credit? Because mm -hmm. I've got this shop and I haven't got anything in it. So what do you reckon? And he went, oh yeah, for you Jill, anything. Out of the blue, one day, I got a phone call from John Vaughan, and this is a classic situation for a lot of people, said, we've been let down by our current supplier and wondered if you'd be able to do, I don't know, 20 suites of cushions in a couple of weeks, or we know our deadline is so-and-so, and it's like, no, <laughs> don't know about that. Yeah, I'll be fine, yeah, this is the <laughs> opportunity. Day and night, you know, yeah. All of these different things started to come into play. Mm. So, we still have Meadow Street, we also have a factory unit in Sunnyside Road mm -hmm. and it just grew yeah. and grew. Okay, so I'd like to take you back into your, your, your early life. So you <laughs> lived on the beach in Breen? Yeah, in the just off the beach, yeah, behind the sand dune and bought a caravan <laughs> and lived on the beach at Breen. That's true. We then met a guy from London who turned out to be a bit of a gangster but um, he started talking to us and said that he was going to be opening an indoor market in Bristol, mm. um, in Bedminster in Bristol. And so we said, okay, so we'll, we'll go and do that. And we were selling China at the time. He was an unscrupulous guy and wanted everybody to sign contracts to, you know, that was gonna, as you, um, if your business increased on your takings, um, then then your rent would go up accordingly so that he could bask in the glory of your efforts. Oh, I see. So it was mm -hmm. one of these systems, which you know probably still goes on today somewhere. But anyway, so it's like, oh, really? I don't think I'm going to sign this. And so I told him I wasn't going to sign it and then consequently persuaded everyone else that they didn't want to sign it in either. Quite a risky thing to do. Yes, oh, it was. Because then he and his bouncer, who was called Molly, this is, this is absolutely, it sounds far-fetched, doesn't it? But his bouncer, Molly, um, came down uh, came down to, on my, to, to see me on my stand and said, you know, well, we've got a problem with you. <laughs> That's really unlucky because I'm not, you know, got to sign it. I'm not going to sign it. And so I picked up everything that I could on the stand, like crock pots and mugs and all sorts of china, <laughs> threw it all on the floor, and that all went down the tiles towards them. My and God. then I ran up and out of the side steps. So tell, tell me about mm. what happened to you in your teenage years. At that time in my life, I didn't have the gung-ho attitude. I didn't have the strength of character in any way. I was going out with um, a boy in, who was older than me. Ultimately, ended up in my getting pregnant. I didn't know I was pregnant. My mum didn't know I was pregnant. And I was, I was still at school. It was a, a thing of shame. So it was certainly something that you were... You, you had to be ashamed of, and what will the neighbours say, and what will other people think. I fought verbally, fought very, very hard to keep him. Um, I called him Martin, and I breastfed him. And I remember being up in the top room of the house, right up in the attic, looking out of the window over the, the front of the house, and I could see 
these people coming in and walking away with a, you know, obviously a baby in a, a white shawl. And, um, and I remember that clearly. I do have a happy ending, yes, too. No, yes, um, just to put that one in there, my, my son um, found me because, again, you know, as in those days, you know, things, the laws change these days, I think, but I was never able to find um, my son who is called Julian. Um, I was never able to look for him. I could only make it so that his birth certificate had my name on, my full name, which is quite unique and so he was able to find me if he accessed his birth certificate and that's exactly what he did. Would you change your whole life on one single kiss? This is Amelia. I come from a very small place in Norway. I'm like a village girl, farmer's daughter. And I think at the time it would have been impossible for me to imagine that I could make a living writing, make a living teaching other people to write, and run my own company. I've read a lot about entrepreneurs and I was very I was a big fan of like powerful women doing their thing, figuring out their big dream and just going for it. Um, but I didn't think that would kind of apply to someone like me. It seemed to apply to people who grew up either super poor and then scrapped their way up or already started in quite a privileged position and worked their way from there. Yeah. And I was just like an average girl. I was a normal person from a normal farm in a normal place. So that's your career is making, so when you talk about the entrepreneurial business, yeah. the entrepreneurial business is ghostwriting, writing for other people, writing yourself, publishing. and. Uh, writing coaching. Um, writing coaching. Yes, it's writing coaching has become more and more of what I do uh -huh. um, and something I find incredibly rewarding. So how did you get to Western Superman? I, I dropped out of high school and moved across the country when I was 18 years old. I was like, yep, done with this, need something new. Um, and I started a life there and I had jobs and I eventually got married and and had a nice life. And then when I was 25, I was like, I think it's time to go to university. I, I'm ready so for wait, that So wait, you got married now. before the age of 25? We've so... been together for a long time. We met when I was 18 and got together when I was just 19. So we'd been together for a few years and it felt like That's it was time. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then I decided to go to university and part of my degree in translation, I had to do an exchange year in an English speaking country. Yeah. And I chose England because it was close and yeah. easy to get to. and. Um, easy to go home and visit the husband when I could. Um, and I met this girl who was a lovely girl and it felt like the best friend I'd ever had. And I felt a kind of a, a calm with, that I, when I was with her that I hadn't experienced before. And I just thought, oh, I finally found like a really good friend. This is great. It's amazing. Um, and then right before I was going to leave for home, I started feeling really anxious and uncomfortable. Um, I had panic attacks like you wouldn't believe mm. um, and right like towards the end of that last week she kissed me very it's not very nice you shouldn't really kiss people who are married <laughs> she did it anyway um, and it was one of those like oh moments mm. it just everything fell into place I was like oh no I'm not anxious about going home I'm just gay that's so much easier to deal with <laughs> yeah all right um, but obviously I then had to go home and deal with the fact that I I had yeah. not realised something quite fundamental about myself for a lot of years. I had to come out to my husband, which yeah. is not something you ever think you're going to do, mm -hmm. don't have a plan for. Uh, I had to come out to my parents, which was also difficult mm -hmm. in a whole different way. Um, How did everyone take it? Everyone took it really a lot better than I was afraid of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was very scared but no one took it as poorly as I thought they would. Um, and after a while, everyone was fine with it. It was obviously hard. Like, mm. I loved my husband very deeply, but in a different way. Mm. Um, and we had this whole life planned out that suddenly wasn't to become a thing. Mm. I managed my time through an endless array of to-do lists. <laughs> there is never a, a stop to the to-do list and I make prioritized to-do lists so at any one point I have um, kind of my number one priority projects which are the things that have a deadline coming up fairly soon mm -hmm. or that are really important to me to get done for other reasons like mm -hmm. personal reasons or just 
because it would be nice to see them in the world. Mm -hmm. Then I have my like number two projects. There are things that have a deadline somewhere in the future but aren't super in like a rush yeah. or things that I just want to do. And then I have the number three projects and they are my dream projects. Okay. Things that I don't have to do but I would quite like to do. Yeah. And I try to at every one time be working at two number one projects, one number two and one number three because otherwise the, the dream projects would never get yeah. done. Yeah, no, they would never yeah. work. That's true. I always say that my favorite place in West is table 29 at Brunello. Um, when I first moved here I needed somewhere to go to do my writing and that became the first table I sat down on and since then I just kept writing from there. Um, and I just, I, I love the people, I love the atmosphere. I've been there enough that I thanked them in the acknowledgements of my grammar book. <laughs> so a little bit of a Brunello nerd I'd say. Um, but also obviously the beach, like you can't live in Western not love the beach, I don't think. I try to walk along it either every lunch or every morning, depending on when I'm getting to the office. Mm -hmm. And I just love the, the kind of the tide. I love how different it is. I love how it's always changing and it's very inspirational. Sarah is set on making this seaside town a go-to destination for entertainment. So it sounds to me like you're almost on a mission to say, look, this place is amazing, but what is your dream for Western? Because it seems to me that you're building one. Because of the events that you're creating, there is, seems to be a vision, even if it's a secret mission. <laughs> Share it. <laughs> okay. Mm. So it's really to keep adding to the offer that Western's got. And whether that's music, culture, food, open spaces, events, it's happening, it's happening anyway. So in the last three years I've been here particularly, you can see this wave of regeneration um, and it's speeding up all the time. And there are so many of these good streams now, these good things to do. I think people keep reverting back to this old manuscript um, of what Western is, what it's like, and it just doesn't apply anymore. So what got you into doing this? How did this come up for you? It's a career path. <laughs> hmm. uh, so I kind of fell into it. I'm a, a very over-organised person. So when I decided to look for my next job, uh, way back in my uh, 20s, I had a very big plan of all these companies I was going to uh, contact, had my CV done. And while I was putting up this big spreadsheet of um, career finding, I saw an advert in the paper for a job at Bristol Bloom Fiesta. Mm. And I thought I'd go for interview experience. Mm. Um, got on really well with the event director and she offered me the job, which was quite a surprise. So you told me before about having done some ballet when you were younger. So do, was that ever something that you wanted to do as a career or not so much? When I stopped, I realised it wasn't ballet that was the thing that gives me so much joy, it was just dancing. Was there a reason why you had to stop? What happened? Uh, I started having some uh, quite a lot of hip pain mm -hmm. and very soon it became clear that uh, the hip was too shallow. So I had a, a complete sort of pelvic reconstruction where they, 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 they make you a hip out of your own bone, mm -hmm. and kind of bolt you together. Mm -hmm. And that was quite a while in hospital and, and to walk again. Oh, that sounds painful. I've got beautiful scars. I'm very <laughs> proud of my scars, actually. Why do you say you're proud of your scars? Because it's something you've lived through. It's my journey, yeah. And yeah. it's uh, what I've gone through, how I've come out the other side. I dance a lot now as well. Uh, <laughs> I've got new hips, so I'm making them move. I know, it's like, I'm going to show them off. <laughs> yeah. I was born in Weston, in the old maternity hospital. Mm -hmm. Um, and my family are still in Colmesbury, so just outside Western. I moved to Southampton for my degree. And from there, I uh, went to Bristol. And then I took this job and moved back to Western, right back to where it started. How did it feel to come back? The previous boss um, from the previous job, when I said where I was going, he was quite derogatory. Mm. And uh, I immediately got my hackles up. <laughs> yeah. Straight away. Yeah. Um, and I do feel very privileged to be back here. Um, I'm very proud to be back in Western, definitely. If you were given away as a baby, would you spend your time helping the people who have had to make the streets their home? This is Val. What's your 
dream for Western Supermare if you had a magic wand, what would you do? What would I do? Oh, that's a big question, isn't it? Oh, I like that. Can I make all that never be a homeless person ever again? So tell me about the homeless work in, in Western. The homeless, uh, in January of this year, I've seen a picture on Facebook, as you do. Um, this lady, she put this picture up of this homeless man, and I thought, okay. And I thought, I said to Portia, I said, should we go out and have a look, see if we can help in any way? He looked a bit derelict and that of himself in the one of the Victorian shelters on the sea front. We went along and we found four more. Mm -hmm. I said to Portia, oh my God. Mm -hmm. So we went home, we went and got flasks, water bottles and everything. Mm -hmm. We went down and had a chat with them. And mm -hmm. um, they were really nice guys to be quite honest with you. And we said, would you like a hot water bottle? Um, would you like a drink? Is there anything you really need, i.e. clothes or anything? If we can get anything, let me know. Mm. So I kept that up for a couple of days just to see if it was just them four. But I went around the town and it was more and more and more everywhere I went. I mm. thought, there's a problem in Western now. Mm. So I set up the Facebook page with at two o'clock in the afternoon. By four o'clock, I had two and a half thousand members. Wow. That's People impressive. willing to keep come out and help. Yeah, to come out and help. What happened? You know, we're, we're hearing about Western being a really up and coming town. Is it because Western's been an up and coming town and then suddenly we're getting an influx of homeless people? Were they already there, but we were blind? We were blind, all of them. Everybody was blind. They didn't see them, they were letting them through the cracks. Like, you can't help it, but mm. that's just the way it is. Like, we never know ourselves. Who's going to be homeless in the morning? You yeah, could yeah. have debt. Yeah. Ew, you've got a broken relationship. Yeah. Anyone can become homeless. So, so tell me about the work that you're currently doing. I'm a subcontractor for Hermes. They actually give me the work and we go out and deliver it. Mm. And in the winter time I've had, I've been doing it 16 years, uh, I've had pe the elderly ring me up, Val can you pick me a pint of milk up when it's really really cold and snowy, mm. they can't get out and I might be yeah. the only person I see in the day, wow. some of them. So, so Val, what is your intention behind doing this film? To show other women, no matter where you come from, if you're a single woman, married, or you're just a normal person, you can achieve whatever you want to achieve in life. If I can achieve by having nine children, hold down a full-time job as well, anybody can do it. So would you say the nine kids are your greatest achievement? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. would very much so. I wouldn't be without them. Now, what led to such a big family? Well, I was adopted at the age of six weeks old, mm -hmm. but being a lonely child, I never had that mm -hmm. sibling relationship. And mm -hmm. me and my eldest daughter, we've got such a like a relationship, it's like brother, like two sisters really. Yeah. So, did you try and find your birth mother? What was the story? About? I found, I went down to birth, deaths and marriages. We'd done the search on her through the records. Mm -hmm. Found out she had four, four children, four other children, she got married. So I went on 192.com, found her on there in her married name. Mm -hmm. Phoned up where she's living, so I did. And her partner at that time answered the phone and I said, does this person live here? Mm -hmm. Yes. She used to work in Freeman Army and Willis in Bromley. Yes. I said, is it possible that I, is it possible you can go and get her but make sure she's sitting down mm -hmm. and also you're standing beside her? Mm -hmm. And they, she come on the phone and I said, are you, what's it? And uh, she said, yeah. I said, did you work in Freeman Army and Willis in Bromley? She said, yes. I said, well, I'm your daughter, you gave up for adoption. She cried and she didn't know what to say, really. It was a bit of a shock. Yeah, I and I said to her, look, if you want, you can put down the phone. Mm -hmm. I said, a short choice at the end of the day, but here's my number. Mm -hmm. If you want to ring back. Mm -hmm. Her partner at the time took my number. Within an hour, she rang me back. She was more settled. She took it in. Mm -hmm. And we chatted over the phone for weeks on end. Mm -hmm. She sent me a Christmas card, like mm -hmm. from her and her partner. And then she decided she was coming down in January of mm. 2001. You know, when you're talking about that, it sounds to me that you really protected her. There's something about the way in which you seem to take care of people that seems important. Is that why you've ended up working for homeless people? Yes, it is. I really it's do just care that about what people. I've been a carer. I was a carer when I first came into Western. When I moved from Ireland over here in 1990, I went straight into care work. You just take things as you find them. You take places. 
it all depends what you want to make of the place and I love the place I'm on holiday 365 days a year what more can you be asking for